I hope the the screen is visible to everybody. Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. So we are into the third session today, right? So today's module, we would be looking into certain advanced agile techniques. So just to recap, I think in the previous session, we did a deep dive into the agile methodologies and try to understand different techniques or elements of agile, you know, how do we work in agile environment? Uh, what are the features of agile? We spoke about user stories and all other concepts, right? So today's session is an extended version of what did we speak on the second session about agile techniques, because this is much more a little deeper concept of agile. So that's why, you know, we split it into two different modules so that everyone, uh, you know, is able to understand. Okay, so let, let's get started with this, right? So today's today's session, we would be starting about certain, you know, uh, deeper concepts of agile where, you know, you might be feeling that, uh, you know, these topics are pretty much on a theoretical note, you know, whereas, uh, but the application, or I would say the implementation of these concepts in agile are actually found into core product based companies you know if you are into a services industry you might not be able to execute these certain uh, advanced agile technique whereas product based companies for example let's say apple google um, netflix they would you know uh, they would definitely have the implementation of the concepts that we are going to talk about all right so first of all one is uh, the very first is story mapping so what we read about user stories you know creation or division of different uh, modules of my problem statement splitting it up into multiple user stories now what is story mapping for me So story mapping is a technique that is used in product discovery. OK, so if we want to outline a new product or a new feature, you know, for an existing product, this story mapping concept helps your eye on the bigger picture while, you know, we are providing details of the entire application or the product that we are trying to build. The main purpose of storytelling is to facilitate a product discovery and prioritization of my development work. So we achieve this by putting user activities and tasks on a map and the story maps and the story map, you know, generally shows us how each individual story fits into the whole application. And this makes it easy to gap any you know, to marginally reduce any gap and decide that which story is important for us to be covered first over the another story. So you will have your stories written as user activities. You will have a potential timeline that you want to put. You want to, you know, make it as high level, lower level, as you can see into the diagram so that you understand what are your high priority story mapping task and what are your low priority story mapping task. Now, story mapping supports two values of Agile Manifesto. If you remember if when we started about the Agile Manifesto, so story making supports two of the Agile Manifesto. One is the customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and another is responding to change over you know following a plan. So you get the best results when you collaborate with a user or a domain expert, right? Now, let's say you are working into the healthcare industry or you are working in the medical industry. So and you are trying to develop a service or an application or a product with respect to that domain. So you would only get to know about the product's usability, the product's you know capabilities that a company or an organization needs to put only when you collaborate with domain experts. Now, someone who is in you know, uh, very much familiar with the work that your application is trying to do or support, that solves your problem, right? So that sort of a discussion and being, and from that discussion, when you start mapping the concepts that you have discussed, you are trying to outline the major problem statements that your, you know, application is going to solve, right? So it's easy to respond to certain changes also that might come over the development life cycle. Because when you add a new user story or you change 
or you remove an existing cons, uh, you know, feature, it's easy to spot what else needs to be done, you know, in order to optimize your product. Okay, so that's where is user mapping cons story mapping comes into picture, where it eventually helps you to understand the flow of your features, you know, divide it into high level, low level tasks. You put a timeline against it, and also the concept or the segregation of high level stories, medium level stories, and lower level stories helps you to prioritize the product development and the product feature that you are planning to deliver. Okay, similar to that. Another is impact mapping. Now, impact mapping is a powerful technique that helps teams understand how to link the work they do with the results that their organizations would like to achieve. Now, let's say I'm working for a firm whose annual revenue should increase, who has, a, I mean, that organization has a goal that their annual revenue for 2022 should increase by $30,000 or let's say $30 million, for example, okay? That's that's their target and a hypothetical scenario. Now, if it's a product-based company, how would they achieve that goal? They would only achieve that goal when their product development is ready, their product is sold into the market, customers are using it, and they are paying for the product, right? Only then a company would earn back the revenue, right? So when I try to develop a product, it is very important that we understand what is the impact that I'm going to bring with this service or product that I'm developing. Now, generally what happens is when you talk about a you know, typical RPA project, robotics process automation project that you, you know eventually you are a business analyst for, there also we do an impact mapping. What is the benefit that the company is going to get while investing on RPA? So generally what happens is we get headcount release. Now let's say I have 30 people who is every day doing a repetitive or a mundane task. When the moment I pull in or bring in an RPA robot, the 30 people's task is now automated. So what I'm gaining, my impact of doing an RPA automation is 30 FT benefit. That means I'm getting 30 headcounts or the cost of 30 employees is getting saved with, with in terms of my automation coming into the picture. So impact mapping is considered as a lightweight collaborative planning technique for teams that want to understand the impact of the software or the product that they are trying to build. It is based on user interaction design, outcome driven planning and mind mapping. Okay. Impact map helps delivery teams and stakeholders to visualize the roadmap, explain them how deliverables connect to the user needs are and communicate how user outcomes relates to the organizational goal. Now, certain organizations have targets of company, sorry, a customer CSAT. That means customer satisfaction. That means if I'm rolling out 1000 surveys for this month to my customer, my target is to achieve 80% CSAT. That means out of 100, 80 customers of mine should be happy. So that's my organizational goal. So impact mapping can also be a customer satisfaction not necessarily be let's say in terms of money or you know revenue correct now why we need to use impact mapping as i said it's a fast visual and collaborative technique it makes it easy for the teams to analyze various roles and backgrounds you know or if you have any hidden assumptions or any important decisions that you need to you know you need to make so all these would come up it's a practice that agile teams go through. So it provides just enough structure for the agile teams to facilitate effective planning and prioritization because they know their target goal. They know that this product is developed to gain this impact for my company, right? Now, who should use this technique? That's the next question. Now, impact mapping is generally used by people like product manager, business analyst, business sponsors, and probably let's say certain senior technical leadership working with iterative software delivery, where the focus is on effort, restructuring your existing initiative, or communicate a vision for a new idea. Okay, in all certain scenarios, impact mapping plays a very important role to visualize the impact that 
the work that you are doing is going to bring. Now, how do you make an impact mapping, right? Now, think about a behavior change that would make a big impact on the users of a product. Now, let's say tomorrow Apple brings a new feature into iOS 15. Okay, any random new feature. That means that feature would impact the users of iPhone. Correct? So capture them. So what Apple would be interested to do before implementing that feature, Apple would try to capture the needs or the impact that this feature is going to bring. Post it into a big note, write it down in the, you know, probably in a, in a bigger, in a bigger board and try to create group impactors. You remember last session we spoke about personas, right? Who is my target audience, correct? So similarly in impact mapping, they do a group impactors, whether it is impacting any personas or any specific age group, any specific user category. All these analyses are done behind any feature release of any product. Okay, now we add deliverables that could support those behavioral changes on one side. That's that's the benefit of, you know, undergoing an impact mapping before any product or a feature analysis. Now, if you broadly see that impact mapping can typically look like this. So let's say you have a goal, as I said at the very beginning, impact is nothing but what is the goal of my organization? It can be a monetary goal, it can be a revenue-based goal, it can be a customer satisfaction gaining goal. So if you see this image, it says that I need to increase the number of customers by 20% in 2020. That's the achievement or the goal that I have set for my organization. Now to achieve this goal, what are the impact mapping I have to do? So what are my impacted areas? So there are three, three things that your you know, impact mapping connects to. As I said, one is your actors, one is personas, and the third one is you know, your user category or the deliverables that you are trying to bring. Okay, so your actors or personas, then what is the impact? And then what is the deliverables that is required? So if you see increase the number of customers by 20%, new customers rather, my actors, that means this goal is directly proportional to existing customers because existing customers will go by word of mouth. That means impact is they will recommend my company to their friends and what is the deliverable? I would provide them a referral bonus. So if you see any major company these days have this concept of referral bonus, any product based company, you know, you go and refer, use a buy a product, you use it, you refer to them, they give you a coupon code based on which, you know, you can go and retrieve some goodies, right? So that sort of a thing is what we call it as impact mapping. So when I target about my existing customer as an actor, my impact is word of mouth or recommendation of my product by word of mouth. And probably when I understand but you know, you have referred uh, AppStick America to certain people, Bob might give you certain, you know, referral bonus or benefits, correct? So that's how companies impact mapping happens. Second is, let's say, uh, you know, I, I'm getting into uh, a specific product or, or I'm trying to convince a specific group of people, okay? That's, let's say, my taxi customers, right? Choose my convenience method and they choose their convenience method of bringing an impact. And what I do is, you know, let's say I'm a travel firm. So what I do, the moment I am being recommended by my customers, I give them any bookable advanced trips, you know, any uh, any messaging, uh, any any sort of a price based advertising, uh, any any sort of a benefit. That's what is my deliverables, right? Certain impact can be only through my female customers right then another impact i can bring could be through my tax heavy riders people who are let's say in if somebody is technically very heavy uh, sound and we are doing some technical products and deliverables those tax heavy people i would target you know if i'm a traveling company i would try to target frequent travelers you know where they can you know do certain sort of uh, airport uh, promotions for me you know, a lot of people are doing Instagram promotions these days, right? Social media influencers. So all these are to create an impact for the product. And these are the paths that helps me to plan the impact that I'm trying to make. All right. Okay. So with this, I'll take a pause and see if there are any questions from anybody.
clear, everyone? Yeah, it's clear to me. All right, perfect. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Second is decision modeling. Okay, so as I said in at the beginning of this, you know, session that today's topics are very much deeper concept where you know you might not find that you are able to implement this the, for the company that you are working but as i said typically the deeper agile concepts are utilized by product based companies rather than service based so if you opt to work for a product based companies and they are into the agile platform which most of the you know product tech ad tech companies are these days you know fintech ad tech whatever products they are developing you would eventually see somehow or the other these concepts are being utilized you know as i said it might not come in bunched together that all these techniques of agile are being utilized but something can come in bits and pieces okay now let's understand what is decision modeling very very important so decision modeling is a process that enables a team to come to a certain conclusive decision of a product delivery or a service right so what happens is decision models includes two system models one is decision table another is decision tree that detail the system logic that either controls the user function or decides that what an action a system will take in various circumstances so i let's say have multiple constraints or criteria of coming to a decision okay so now let's say i have three routes to travel to my office from my home okay let's say route a takes 15 minutes but a little risky because you know uh, the the amount of it's a highway so the amount of accidents are more let's say route b is taking 25 minutes but it's a you know it's not a proper high express way it's a normal road so the accidental uh, prone of you know in that road is less it but it takes 25 minutes because it's not a shortcut and the third one and let's say the route c it it takes one hour okay and let's say it's a bypass connected way to my office from my house and it takes one hour now let's say and there is no chance of getting accidents at all now if i need to decide as an individual that which route should i opt to visit to my office now what i would do is for this decision i will first try to map my priority that do i need to reach my office in 15 minutes is faster execution time of reaching office is my priority if that is my need then my weight would eventually go towards the route a which takes me to my office in 15 minutes but the constraint is that you know the drawback or the pro or the cons is that you know this route is an express highway so there's a high chance that you know there's i can have an accident so if i do not want to take that risk potentially then i would also probably look for route b which takes let's say 25 minutes 10 minutes extra but i have a lesser chance of having any accident okay and probably when i map this with my route c i'll say oh no this is one and a half hours too much time so what i would do considering all my situational approaches i'm trying to take a decision that route b 25 minutes with minimal percentage of accident is the path that i need to choose so what i did i tried to build up a points to come to a conclusive decision so that's what decision modeling helps so often you know your program managers or business analysts will use one of the either decision modeling technique based on the circumstances okay so decision tables that you see on the right hand side are generally used to ensure that every permutation of applicable decision choices are getting explored whereas decision tree that you see on the right hand side are more consumable for business stakeholders and are typically used to show a collapsed view of a decision tree by only modeling the decision choices that lead to an outcome so the the, the round balls that you are able to see the top is the root node or what we call it as root node okay root node is the con is the root issue that i'm trying to solve that means for me in this example visiting or you know traveling to office would be my root node okay after that the choices that i have becomes three different leaf nodes and the more i drill down you know i come to the 
towards i move travel i i travel towards the conclusive decision so if you see on the left hand side decision table let's say i am a bank and i want to explore certain criteria that based on what criteria i should give or i should understand that which customer of mine is eligible for a loan from me so what i can easily do is i can quickly draw a table where i can put components like loan amount age and eligibility okay now in loan amount i need to put my criteria okay now let's say if i want to give anybody a loan less than equal to $1000 i my age bracket for this is less than equal to uh, no, less than 18 years or greater than uh, greater than 18 years or less than equal to 18 years okay so now what i understood is if i am a bank and i am trying to give a loan my first criteria for age group of 18 is to check that what's the loan amount or it could be reverse if someone is coming to me for a loan i would first ask you hey how much amount of loan do you need you said thousand dollars okay then what i'll do i'll check if your age is greater than you know it's greater than 18 or if your age is less than equal to 18 so if you are greater than 18 i say yes you are eligible if your age is less than equal to 18 i say no you are not eligible so this helps me to visually decide or map the requirements and then come to the conclusion if it is thousand dollars to two thousand dollars my age bracket is greater than 21 and less than equal to 21 and any loan amount that is greater than two thousand dollars my age bracket is greater than 25 and less than equal to 25 now there are multiple conditions to me right what exactly happens here is with thousand dollars i have two conditions to verify with thousand to two thousand dollars i have again two conditions to verify with greater than two thousand dollars i again have two conditions to verify so in such cases decision table helps me to understand now let's say there are only two cases here okay one is my loan amount and the other one is let's say one is amount the other one is age now what if i want to bring in another criteria let's say your income level how much the customer is earning so the more parameters i add i my mapping of the amount with the criteria's complexity increases right so it is right now one to two mapping but it can become one to three mapping one to four mapping because as a bank i'll just not look into one single criteria there might be multiple filtering criteria correct so to do this mapping enablement it is very very important that you do a decision table so if you see here a decision table is a tabular format of decisions and their outcomes with each column in the decision table represents one potential permutation of the decision in the system what is it either they are eligible or they are not eligible so the decision table contains three main areas one is the condition one is the outcome and the third is the columns where each permutation of your decision choice is listed with the appropriate outcomes that are marked so we would say that i have a condition here i have a condition i have a you know i have a condition i have an outcome and what i'm trying to do with this column i'm trying to make each permutation combination possible and then come to this target variable all right so that's how you know decision trees or tables have been you know uh, ex explored now what does decision tree do so in decision tree this is what we call it as root node so root node is at the very beginning or at the upfront of what is exactly the problem statement that i'm having so a decision tree is also called as a state diagram so remember that a decision tree is also called as a state diagram which is more of a visual way to show the decision logic in a branching tree by only showing the decisions and the choice combinations that lead to an outcome okay so now let's say if i have the similar requirement which is done in decision table i can do it here also okay so here i can say if loan amount is greater than thousand dollars okay then i check if my age is less than equal to 18 or my age is greater than equal to 18. now if my age is greater than equal to 18 
I am let's say eligible less than equal to 18 let's say not eligible so like this I can also form the same concept in decision tree and see what the decision model is telling so this model is a, is a great use for verifying the system logic that I'm trying to build based on my business requirement all right so when do we use decision model the next question is this so one is to understand when you have to detail the specific pieces of your system information for a user story that's when you need to understand decision modeling that before coming to a conclusion i need to explore each and every possibility in this case the decision model is identified and created for the user story you know that it supports my decision of a loan amount being mapped with age and then followed by the targeted eligibility criteria. So a program manager or a business analyst will identify that as a user story that requires the system logic to execute this decision and come up with a response or let's say come up with the decision that I'm, I'm willing to you know, reach out to so that's where you know your decision modeling comes into picture so what you typically need to do is you generally try to consider that you have your root problem here what is the problem that you are solving that becomes your root node then from this root node what are your possibilities let's say path as as i said let's let's say traveling to office so traveling to office is my root node from there i have three options i have root a i have root b and i have root c okay so now in that case i will after this you know i will what i will do is from there i will try to jot down what this two what my root a is giving me what my root b is giving me what my root c is giving me okay then these nodes would be my final decision nodes or let's say after this i have one more criteria so that means i can pull in trees again from here okay so more complex your your logic is the more lengthier your decision tree becomes and then this becomes your result nodes all these are your resulting nodes right so these are the techniques that typically gets utilized for a decision modeling now similar to decision modeling we have something called as state modeling as well all right so what is state modeling for us right so state modeling describes the timely behavior of the class objects over a period of time a state model is generally considered that has a state diagram where each state diagram describes a class in the model now let's say your state model shows uh, your, so your generally state modeling takes three things one is it takes something called as first it takes something called as events okay second it takes something called as state and third it takes something called as transition so these are the three things which comprises of state modeling now let's say i am at an initial state which is here i need to come to this state so my path is to reach from here to here but I have certain conditions to reach to this conclusion. So what I would do, I would probably start to do a state change, which is like from this, I will first do a transition to state one. I then would do a transition to state two, or let's say when I'm in state three, I might look into this option. I might also look into this option and then come into the decision-making stage so now let's understand what is what are events here so events generally what are events in my state modeling so events are the incidents that take place at a particular time for example let's say a train is departing from one station to another that's the event a person switches off the button of the lights is an event me getting up from my chair and walking towards the door is an event events are a collection of incidents that i'm trying to work upon what are states for me states represents the value at of the attributes of an object at a particular time 
that means state defines the behavior of an object at a point any point of time like water you know at a point of time can either be in solid state or liquid state or gaseous state okay so if i take a glass of water that water can either be an ice which is it is solid state or it can be liquid state like normal water that we carry or it has to go into a gaseous form right so state defines what is my present value at that point of time and at one time you can be at one single state right now let's say a train is traveling from point a to point c right it has to cross through point b right so during this journey the, the event is that the train is traveling the state is that it was at the destination sorry it was at the source then it starts traveling it moves towards the first destination which is point b then it moves towards the third destination which is point c so that's called state now what are transitions here what do i mean by transitions now transition means when an object changes its current state okay when an object changes its current state to another state it is termed as transition that means from source to point b when the train is reaching that's called the transition of the train's position from source to destination water is now let's say liquid in a in a jar the moment i put it into the refrigerator it converts to solid the moment it becomes ice so that's called the transition from liquid to solid right so that's the transition for me so the source state and the target state of a transition should be different okay because if a glass of water is in liquid and you pour it in another glass and you say the state has changed no it doesn't make sense because the state or the nature of water is still liquid so there is no state transition happening you just poured the water from one glass to another but when i convert the water into ice that's where the state transition is happening so all these you know modeling concepts of a product how do i relate it a product let's say is at the very preliminary stage of its de development or inception right the moment i start adding features my product starts transitioning its state okay let's say to create a product i have three states okay state 1 state 2 and state 3 right every time i add let's say two features my state transition happens so let, let's say i'm creating a mobile phone developing a mobile phone let's say so first I, when i assemble the hardware it is here the moment i put the my operating system in it it goes into state 1 now it's a, another state after operating system when i put you know let's say uh, all the apps inbuilt apps it goes to state 2 and then after this when i do the thorough testing or utilization uh, i i come into stage 3 and after the product quality measurement is done my final state or the product delivery is ready so that's how state modeling gets examined and it helps you to understand at what stage your product or service your app is in the duration of the development life cycle right any questions before we move on to the next one everyone is silent today looks looks difficult easy to understand what's what's the reaction i'm i'm following so far <laughs> okay daisy is following what about bilha i'm following too <laughs> that's great and yeah. me too and me too all right see this these are certain you know as i said it's it's a little deeper concept of agile so you know immediately you might not be able to visualize probably let's say i would say that you might need to hear the recording once again or you might need to go through some of the additional documents to understand but the purpose of giving you this background is that if you are working on a product based company these techniques would eventually be there right now if you are been asked to develop a state transition model you know for a product 
right from its inception to its delivery, you should be able to deliver, you know, design it. You know, it should not be that you have, you know, fallen from the sky and you it, it appears to be a Greek, Latin and French to you, right? Okay, perfect. So moving on to the next very, very important concept of any product service or anything that you develop. That is called minimal viable product or MVP. That's what is the, you know, uh, abbreviation of MVP. So a minimal viable product or MVP is a product with enough features, okay, to attract early adopters or customers and validate a product idea early in the product development life cycle. Now, what does that mean? Let's say I have an idea of uh, a developing an app, okay, uh, uh, that captures, uh, you know, uh, how much time you are spending on Instagram, how much time you're spending on Facebook, how much time you're spending on your mails, how much time you're spending for sleep, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, let's say it's a healthy find me app, correct? So the moment I plan for this app to be launched, let's say I target to add 20 features, but immediately during launch, I might not be in a situation to add all the 20 features. So what I decide, I decide to take top five features among these 20, put it in back to the app and then get it published into Apple store or Google store and see how customers reactions are. So that's why what is an MVP is it is a very basic version of my product, but it has enough features that defines my product. Okay, and it would attract the early adopters so that they use this product, validate this in, and give us feedback. So I'm still into the development lifecycle. So if you see any major product that is released, my, let's say Microsoft Windows 11 that got released last year, correct? What Microsoft does is immediately when the Windows 11 was, you know, uh, announced by Satya Nadala, they released a beta version of it, a beta version of any software you see in the market, the companies would first release a beta version. What is beta version? Beta version is actually nothing but the MVP. That means this beta version is an early model of the product that they have developed which they are now circulating across all Windows customers, Microsoft customers, who becomes the early adopters of my Microsoft 11 operating system. They use it and provide the feedback. And based on that, I start enhancing my product, that where my customer feedbacks are. Let's say 90% of my customers are complaining for slow performance or latency. So Microsoft takes that feedback and starts working on making Windows 11 a more better, a faster operating system. Let's say some group of customers are complaining about security protocols or compliance. You know, let's say your password is, these criteria are much easier to crack. So Microsoft would start working on to that piece as well. So in industry, as such as the software industry, the MVP can help the product team receive user feedback as quickly as possible to iterate and improve the product. Okay, now what are the expected benefits of minimal viable product? The primary benefit of an MVP is you can gain understanding about your customer's interest, experience in your product without fully developing the product. Okay, the sooner you can find out whether your product will appeal to your customers, the less effort and expense you tend to spend on a product that will not succeed in the market. For example, when Microsoft introduced Windows 8, it was not that success compared to Windows XP and Windows 7 right? Then they released Windows 8 Pro, right? So neither of them was a market success. So if you see the duration of Windows 8 coming into market after Windows 7 was, I think, hardly two, two and a half years uh, or three years, I think. But after Windows 8, Windows 10 came into picture very fast. Very fast Windows 10 was launched because Windows 8 was addressing a group of customers' problems you know, which was not there in Windows 7. So they needed an upgraded operating system. So Windows 10 became an integration of 7 plus 8, right? So that's how your MVPs are beneficial. So if you want to launch your own app, 
you what would you probably do you would create a basic version of it with certain capabilities put it into google store put it into apple store and see how the customers are using what are the feedbacks they are giving you how many downloads you are having per month right and based on that you can decide let's say you're you know um, by by in a worst case scenario your product is utter for flop you know in over a two two or si two to six months of periods of time you had only 10 downloads of your app do you think you would go and invest more twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars in this app no you would come back and do a research you would deep dive that what has gone wrong or you would also do a market study that this is the app what I'm trying to build. Are there any other apps in the market which is doing the same work? What they have brought into their product? Let me see, analyze, research, and then go back to my roots, right? So what is the potential cost? Proper use of an MBP means that the team may dramatically change a product that they are trying to deliver to their customers, or it can be that you are, you are trying to abandon the product together based on the feedback that you receive from their customer. So the minimum aspect of MVP is to encourage the teams to do the least amount of work possible to bring out the most useful features or feedbacks, which helps team avoid working on a product that no one wants. So you can say it's also a strategy. It's a market strategy to know the customers. And it's a very, very important concept in Agile where we talk about minimal viable product getting delivered. Now, how do I relate it with an RPA? Correct? So let's say you are trying to automate a process, but you don't know which of the platforms, whether you are going to go for UiPath, you want to go for automation anywhere, you want to go for Blue Prism, you want to go for Microsoft Power Automate. So to know that, what we do is there's something similar called as POC, proof of concept. That means I try the very minimal thing and see which one works better for me. Okay. So let's say I will take a certain process and try to automate it with UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism and see which platform is giving me faster execution, less errors, easy to deploy, you know, faster execution, less price and lesser development time frame, lesser resource cost. So those will allow me to go and choose that why I should opt for UiPath instead of automation anywhere in Blue Prism. Licensing is also a factor, correct? So these are the different functional attributes that you need to analyze while you develop a product, you work for a service, or you are trying to automate a process. All I right. Have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, so that sounds... Um, a lot like how Scrum works, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the difference? Or is it the same? So you are asking about Agile and Scrum difference? No. Um, the difference, I'm saying like the MVP, the way MVP works sounds a lot like how Scrum works, where, you know, you develop something and then present it to the customer, get their feedback and then make improvements. Um, what is the difference mm. between Scrum see, and say MVP? So see, uh, what I would say is MVP is, is one of the concept or a method that is utilized to analyze your product's development based on con con you know customer consumer feedback. So typically what they say is the community who uses Agile or Scrum, Agile or Scrum is the say are the same thing at, at certain junction. So Scrum is just one way of approaching your Agile techniques. Okay, so you can say, especially in cross-functional teams, you know, certain times you would see that Scrum does not say anything about technical practices. Scrum focuses mostly on the functional attributes. Correct? So that's why there's a, you could say that there's a thin difference as well. Right, so Scrum per se, you know, is not an agile. Uh, you cannot define Scrum with, let's say, per se, for an agile software development method. Scrum, because Scrum is not a software development method at all. But whereas agile is actually developed for my software development lifecycle. So the key difference between agile and Scrum is that while agile is a project management framework philosophy 
mindset, whatever you call it, that utilizes a scope, you know, utilizes a core set of principles or values. Scrum, I would say, is a specific agile methodology that is used to facilitate a project. It could not, a project can be anything. But whereas agile majority fits into the software development life cycle. So we say that's why, you know, that that says that, you know, agile is, is a mindset or a framework while scrum is a type of agile methodology. So scrum is broken down again into shorter sprints and you can say, uh, you know, smaller deliverables while in agile, everything is delivered, you know, into uh, as, as a complete software development life cycle, not it is not seen as a part of a single project. You know, Agile involves members from various cross-functional teams where Scrum project team includes specific roles assigned to the people like product owner, Scrum master, you know, Scrum practitioner, that kind of a thing comes into picture. So it's, you know, it's how an organization is adopting, right? You, what you, I would say that, you know, both Agile and Scrum are cross-functional. So you would see that there is a merge or blend of techniques at certain point of time. Correct, but Agile is the bigger umbrella, whereas I would say Scrum is a part of Agile. So if I have to draw a Venn diagram, let's say if I say this is Agile, which is the my population, okay, Scrum might, uh, sorry, uh, my bad. So let's say this is, this, this is Agile, which is the entire population of the universe, I would say this is Scrum. So Scrum falls under Agile and utilizes certain capabilities of Agile. But Agile on and holistically, if you see, it's a project management method or philosophy where it has its own values and principles. Make sense? Oh, um, yes, it makes sense. So, <clears throat> so Scrum is basically a, a part of Agile. And so we would say the same for MVP. Yep. So see. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I said. So see, Agile, if you look into the broader world, or if you see the broader universe of this thing, okay, uh, let me take a deeper color. So let me make it as red. So if you see Agile as the universe, I can say under this umbrella, there can be, you know, Agile is, is this is what Scrum is, you know, a portion of it. Another group of Agile can be Kanban under the same umbrella. You know, so another can be, you know, I would say uh, what we call it as uh, lean. So these are all different principles, Kanban, lean, scrum. These are all different strategical principles or methods to drive a project, which in somehow is trying to understand, you know, utilize the methods of agile as a framework. All right, so let's move on to the next. And the third, uh, the last one is very simple, very, very simple. What we spoke in previous session, retrospective. So retrospective means in an agile team, what you will see is the moment your project is delivered, deployed, you are done. There is a retrospection analysis that goes into picture. So this retrospection is then mapped into three different modules what went well in my project analysis. Let's say it was a long six months duration project, correct? You might have a lot of back and forth. You might have done a lot of back, you know, backlog management as we discussed last week. You might have created a lot of user stories. You might have done story mapping. You might have done personas identification, a lot of things. Certain things would have fallen in place. Certain things did not fall in place. There was a learning. So retrospection is a conclusive process to understand and learn from your previous work exposure. So you would see what went well. You write, discuss it. You know, you get all the relevant stakeholders and try to get their collective point of view that what has went well. Second, what has caused me problem? Let's say what has gone well, you know, you could say that this time all the de developers were able to work within their timeline. There was no IT support issues or let's say software access or, you know, development issues that comes into picture. Let's say the software that was developed did not break in production or testing, you know, less amount of test 
testing was required and the software performed as expected. The requirements gathered was up to the mark. What did not go well? What has caused problem? Let's say initial requirement from client was not clear. Multiple requirements gathering session was required to understand the current the real problem that we need to solve. Okay, let's say deployment had been delayed because of certain challenges. So those did not go well or would have caused problem. What could have been done differently? Right. Let's say initially you allocated three developers, but then we understood that no, it's it's required more. So three developers worked for three weeks of time. So the amount of activities or tasks I covered was less. But then I reallocated or I additionally allocated two more developers. So my assessment as a project manager somehow went wrong. Initially, from the beginning, I would have allocated five developers so that my timeline would have been much better. So what we could do is the estimation of resource capability needs to be done better in our next project. That's what would come into what can be done differently. You know, more better customer engagement. You know, so these are all the outcomes of my retrospective phase that will tell me as a learning that how I am evolving as an agile team what we are doing good, what we are not doing good, and what we can do better in future. So it's a, it allows a continuous improvement, continuous development, and you bring in your uh, collective or collaborative ideas of your team to understand that what are the individual expectations so that what can be done better is modified and that fits majority of the team members expectation. Right, make sense? Yes, yes no? It makes sense, yes. All right. So I think, yep, with this, we are done on today's session. So before we discuss the assignment, you know, let's take a pause and see if there are questions, anything that, you know, uh, you would have thought where you need a better clarity or something. Okay, and I'm, I'm back again with the same question from just the, the second last um, mm -hmm. PowerPoint. Um, so I guess I'm really trying to understand the difference between MVP and Scrum. So does it mean, okay, so with, when you're talking about sprints, we're talk, um, does that mean that in, if a sprint is complete, then the project is complete, while MVP no. basically means that, the, that you're only uh, giving just enough features for the product to no. be released to uh -huh. the customers? Is that the difference? No, no, no. I'll tell you. See, okay. even to see, MVP is just a concept. It is not oh. a method. MVP, oh, okay. Let, let's say I am trying to develop an app. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to develop an app or an application. Okay. That tracks your location. Right. And tells you that what is the shortest path. Let's say Google Maps, for example. Now, Google Maps has a lot of features. Now, MVP is just an idea that how much minimum viable features I should put into my product so that customer buys it. Imagine iPhone getting launched with only one single feature you are able to call. Do you think it's a MVP? It's a viable product? Probably no, not. Right? Absolutely not. Why would you pay such huge amount of money just to make a phone call? You will go and buy a Nokia phone. You will go and buy a, a, a normal phone, a normal handset, correct? So MVP is just an analytical approach to understand that, okay, that's why when you create a product roadmap, you will try to find that what are the top five features out of all the features that I should initially put in my app, what are my USP, right? So that when I launch it with even minimum viable features, my customers are able to understand that what this product can do and they give us the feedback. 
minimal viable product is nothing but anything with very minimal feature or basic version to understand how the customers are reacting it is nothing to do with agile it's nothing to do with much with scrum it is just a concept or a method within agile that if i need to understand my customers better okay if i need to reduce the potential risk by understanding that what is customer liking or not liking i need to reduce the development cost what is the market demand all these are done using a method called mvp so if i create a mobile phone or an app with five features out of 20 features that i want to put in i would say that this product is a beta version which is an which is an mvp which means it covers all the basic capabilities and i'm launching it into the market that's it don't confuse it with scrum or you know scrum is a different thing as i said you know scrum will be a functional uh, more of a functional approach right so scrum will be just to facilitate your development so even to develop your mvp sorry even to develop a minimal viable product you need to go through sprints right sprint is to understand your development life cycle let's say i am putting five features in my app i estimate that every feature takes one week for me to develop so my first sprint when i discuss is that my feature one is complete my sprint two will discuss that my feature two is complete sprint three my feature three is complete sprint four i would try to complete feature four sprint five i'll try to complete feature feature five post sprint five i have minimal by basic version of my product ready to be launched oh okay okay now i got it thank you that makes a lot more sense now right. thanks so <laughs> to reach even an mvp i need to go through the process i need to go through the phases right so that's what is called as a minimal viable product thank you that that was a better explanation i appreciate it no worries so if you see this diagram right see this person so the requirement is to reach this boat now minimal viable product is that i am taking one people at a time right now what is the experience i am getting it's a minimal viable experience that means single person is traveling they don't know who are the peers and then they are getting jumped into this ultimate product where i have the accumulation of all the features so that means bringing one one feature at a time is what is my beta version doing it's an mvp minimal viable basic version now this one okay so first time bringing one feature let's say in this feature one has come today feature two got launched okay another sprint feature three got launched in another sprint now collectively after three weeks i see that the minimum three features that i need is available and i say this is the beta version of my product and i launch it make sense it makes sense thank you all right cool okay so let's get started with the assignment so i have reviewed your first assignment so i see that everyone all four of you have submitted first assignment so i would post my comments you know by tomorrow i have reviewed it so i've seen uh, so daisy and bilha good job on the first assignment i would see that uh, i could see that you have done a good work presentation is good a feedback to george is that uh, you need to improve your presentation skills okay anyways i will give you a detailed feedback on the uh, you know individual feedback on your dropbox uh, against each assignment so that you can go through it okay so you would get the complete feedback by tomorrow from me check your dropbox folders uh, i'll try to complete the first as well as the second all right so third assignment <laughs> research on the following use case and write an abstract in your own words first how does agile team make self assessment work now that you have understood the core capabilities or frameworks of agile okay if let's say i am trying to build an agile team and this team is trying to do a self estimation of how do how should they work with what set of values and principles for a uh, building a new product that you need to put then 
let's say you are taking mobile phone as a product and based on which you are developing the self assessment now you can take any product now take any product and prepare a story mapping for a new feature that needs to be included to the product you can take it as a new feature or you can say that if you are trying to make a new product then what are the features you are trying to put and how would you create a story mapping of all these features or services that you are you know rendering into a story mapping all right so these are the two which you need to do in your third assignment any confusions doubts queries on this no right we are good yeah i'm good i'm okay too all, all right perfect great then so all right so i think we are done for the day if there are no more questions then probably we are good we'll connect next week all right great okay, thanks everyone good. thank yep. you have a great weekend thanks everyone you too guys have a great thank weekend. you enjoy yep. the rest Talk of the weekend guys. you too yeah. bye bye thanks bye